Today on Homeschool Arcade, we're talking about the phylum Cnidaria and what's so unique and exciting about what we see there. So let's get to it. Let's consider for a moment the jellyfish and the coral. When you look at these two animals, these two creatures, you look at them and they look very different. The way they, their size, the way they move, their unique characteristics. You look at them and you're like, they're very different. But in fact, they're actually part of the same phylum. That's the phylum Cnidaria. So we're going to take some time today to find out what is unique about this phylum. Why is it that such unique creatures can share the same phylum as Cnidaria? FYI, for your information! Jellyfish don't have brains. Because of this, they have to depend on ocean currents to move. And instead of hunting their prey, they have to wait for it to hit their tentacles on accident. Jellyfish? Corals, sea anemones, hydras. These are actually very simple creatures in terms of their, their structure and the way they operate. There's more than 9,000 of them out there. And not so different from our last video when we did on periphera on the sponges. They're, they're simple in their structure, but they're able to do a lot with their design. So what is it that makes all of these creatures cnidarians? Almost all cnidarians live in salt water, with only a few species that can be found in brackish water or fresh water. They have radial symmetry, which means they have body parts that symmetrically extend outward from some central point, kind of like the spokes in a bicycle wheel. And these animals usually lack any type of skeletal material. However, hard corals build limestone, or, or in other words, calcium carbonate structures around themselves like a body armor. And over time, these structures can become the massive structures known as coral reefs. Now, cnidarians have tissues, but they rarely have organs. They have a mouth and a single central body cavity. What goes in must come out. All cnidarians have tentacles and have stinging cells in their tips. In fact, the name cnidarian means stinging creatures. I think these stinging cells are pretty cool. So I want to share with you just how they work. Now the scientific name for these cells is nidocytes. Each nidocyte contains a structure called a nematocyst. Now, the nematocyst is actually barbed, so it's got kind of a hook on it. And it sits coiled up inside the nidocyte. And when the tentacles containing these specialized stinging, stinging structures are touched or activated, the harpoon-like nematocyst springs out straight through the nidocyte and into the prey. Now, most nadarians also contain toxins which are injected into its prey to help disable it. So now that we know what general physical features Nadarian possess, let's take a look at a few different species. And as you'll see, they're some of the most beautiful and unique creatures found in the ocean. Let's take a minute to talk about the role of nadarians in the ecosystem. First of all, nadarians have an important part in ocean food webs. Their diet usually consists of small planktonic animals that they catch with their tentacles and, st and the stinging cells that we just talked about. And the predators above them on the food web are often specialized fish, worms, snails, and sea stars that will actually eat them. And the Nadarians can also have a huge impact on the physical environment around them. 
Corals, in particular, build massive coral reefs. And these reefs create the foundation for some of the most complex and diverse ecosystems on the planet. In fact, they support more species per unit area than any other marine environment, including about 4,000 species of fish, 800 species of hard corals, and hundreds and hundreds of other species. But these reefs also provide many benefits to nearby coastal communities. First of all, reefs play an important part in buffering the shorelines from wave action and preventing erosion. They also protect the highly productive wetlands along the coast, as well as ports and harbors and the economies that they support. Healthy reefs also contribute to local economies through tourism, diving tours, fishing trips, Hotels, restaurants, and other businesses based near reef systems provide millions of jobs and contribute billions of dollars all over the world. While corals can be extremely beneficial to humans in their communities, other Nidarians can pose a threat to humans that they happen to come into contact with. In fact, all Nidarians have the potential to affect human physiology because of the toxicity and the poison of their stinging cells. And while most are not harmful to humans, some can impart an extremely painful or even deadly sting, such as the Portuguese man-of-war and sea anemones of the genus Acnodendron, aptly called, get this, Hell's Fire Anemone. So now that we've learned about ecological impacts of Nidarians, corals in particular have on the environment around them, it's important to know that unfortunately many of the coral reefs around the world are in danger and they're sick and many are slowly dying. Some of this is due to physical damage or destruction from, from that coastal development, destructive fishing practices and uh, recreational misuse where people are touching and removing portions of the coral. Overfishing can also alter the food web structure and causes cascading effects impacting the coral life. In addition, coral harvesting for the aquarium trade and jewelry can lead to overharvesting of special species, destruction of reef habitats, and reduce biodiversity in the ocean. Lastly, one of the greatest global threats to coral reef ecosystems is increased ocean temperatures and changing ocean chemistry. But fortunately, there are many foundations that now are researching and working hard to protect coral reef ecosystems for us and future generations to enjoy. They're working to establish large marine protected areas for tropical coral reefs. They advocate for the continued protection and incentivize coral reef protection. There are even foundations which grow corals and nurseries in hopes of outplanting specific species into degrading natural coral reefs. So while there is still very much a real danger to many coral reefs, with the efforts of scientists, naturalists, and communities, most of the direct impacts to coral reefs can be lessened and alleviated. Now let's get back to the first thing we discussed. So when you look at these creatures, you see the uniqueness of each of them. But when you consider their similarities, the way they defend themselves, the way they're very simple in structure, the environment in which they thrive, and the way that they work in their local ecosystem, it makes sense that they would be part of the same phylum known as Cnidaria. Hope you enjoyed this video about Cnidarians, and hope you join us next time as we talk about worms. So we really have a lot of great information coming this way. And if you're interested in this topic or any of our other videos, please click subscribe and the bell so you can be notified as videos are coming out. And feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And let's get to it.